with our, our last panel, uh, which is um, to look at unification uh, and the security environment from both a regional and global perspective. And we put together a very, very strong panel for this, uh, for this purpose. Um, <clears throat> again, the morning panels were focused on the business, investment, and economic synergies related to unification. In the afternoon, we've looked at the politics and the economics. Um, and we will continue to do so uh, with this panel of very distinguished speakers. Uh, let me introduce to you, them briefly to you. Their full bios are in the program booklets. Um, our first presenter is uh, Dr. Kurt Campbell. Uh, as many of you know, he is the founding partner, chairman, and chief executive officer of the Asia Group. Uh, but prior to that, for uh, four years from 2009 to 2013, he served as the Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, uh, where he is widely credited as being one of the key architects of the pivot to Asia. Um, uh, speaking second will be uh, Professor Kim Jae Chan of Sogang University. Uh, uh, Dr. Kim is a political science uh, with a PhD uh, uh, from Yale University. Uh, before joining Sogang, he taught at Yale, and he's currently the director of Sogang's Institute for of International and Area Studies. Again, as many of you know, Sogang is also the alma mater of the current president of Korea, so <laughs> the Sogang professors have a lot of juice these days. <laughs> um, our first discussant is Ambassador Stapleton Roy. Ambassador Roy is a Distinguished Scholar and Founding Director Emeritus of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars here in Washington, D.C. Um, he's had many posts in the Foreign Service and has served as ambassador uh, in a number of places. Uh, and in 2001, he received Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson Award for Distinguished Public Service. Um, and our second discussant is uh, Dr. Kim Young-ho, who is professor in the Department of Political Science and Foreign Affairs at Sungshin Women's University in South Korea. He also served uh, previously as secretary to the President for Unification in the Office of the President of the Republic of Korea from 2011 to 2012. Uh, he also served following that as South Korea's ambassador for human rights from 2012 to 2013. So uh, quite a distinguished panel um, to discuss this very interesting and broad topic of Korean unification and the security environment. Um, so our, I will go uh, to Kurt first, if that's Great. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. You can use the podium, or you can, can sit, sit here. here? Good. Sure. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. It's terrific to be back uh, at CSIS. Let me thank Victor. Uh, I think, as you all know, he puts together some of the most interesting, thought-provoking panels as part of his effort here at CSIS. He's also working on, I think, a long overdue study with the Bush Institute to consider what to do uh, with the North Korean human rights situation and the refugees that have been uh, coming out of North Korea now for over a generation. Also. Great to be with Korean friends and the dean of uh, Asia Specialist, uh, State Roy. So I'll try to be on my best behavior, offer some ideas for how to think about next steps as we go forward. I would say, generally speaking, when I worked in government, this is my third time, uh, once on the Joint Chiefs of Staff and at Treasury, another time at the Department of Defense, and most recently at the State Department. One of the things that uh, ties that period together of almost 25 years is a set of unbelievably vexing problems associated with North Korea, that the parameters of which have changed very little uh, over the course of 25 years. And indeed, the playbook itself, as I was listening to the pleas of the three uh, visitors in North Korea about uh, wanting help from the international community or the United States, I mean, it, it is a playbook that it's like the Green Bay Packers of the 1960s. They ran three plays over and over again. And we're in the midst of uh, one of those uh, well understood plays where we r resist initially and then finally we figure out some way to 
talk to the North Koreans. They're disappointed with what we put on the table, but in uh, some either exhaustion or sense of uh, enough of this, release this person. Tom uh, over here, Hubbard is the master of this. He's been involved in several of them. But it, I think it is undoubtedly the case that the people who work on North Korea inside the US government uh, are suffering from not only a kind of fatigue, but a sense of exhaustion in the sense of the strategies that have been applied, right? So there have been periods where we've tried substantial pressure. There have been uh, periods, more regular periods, in which certain complex nuances of diplomacy are tried. We'll try to do this, we'll signal we'll do this, then they'll say this, and then we'll do this. The most arcane uh, choreography and orchestration of diplomacy imaginable associated with North Korea. In this arena, however, with the arrival in power of Kim Jong-un, some of the former playbook no longer works. It's not clear that our former interlocutors at the foreign ministry or even in senior positions in the military have the trust and confidence of the senior leadership. Many of these people are no longer around, frankly. They've been um, uh, retired from service in many circumstances. And so uh, I think we are left with a set of circumstances that most of the senior players inside the US government right now, in a fundamental sense, are at a loss about how to proceed. So we often talk about this with regard to strategic patience. But in truth, it is also the case that many of the tools that we've tried have just simply not worked. And we're at a set of circumstances now where it's not clear fundamentally uh, the way forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we proceed. I think one of the tendencies has been, and I would put myself in this category, is to try to redefine elements of the, pro uh, of the problem. Clearly, we have not been successful at putting substantial pressure on North Korea or seeing any kind of either domestic reform or inhibition on nuclear or proliferation activities. Proliferation of missile, nuclear uncertain. We have not uh, been able to affect the kind of change that basically a generation of di diplomacy has been aiming towards and for. But what we have been successful in, I think generally, is keeping the six party group of nations together. We have kept a relatively solid front. No one has broken out to uh, support or to uh, uh, in, uh, be involved in North Korea and surreptitious activities that are fundamentally not in the best strategic interest of the United States or, uh, or other countries. I think China, over time, has come to understand that North Korea is, in fact, acting in ways that are quite antithetical to its strategic interests. It may not acknowledge that publicly on a regular basis, but I think what we've seen in the last several years is a deep frustration and worry that in many respects what North Korea is doing is creating a security dynamic in North Korea that is profoundly not in China's strategic interests. Now what that means over time, I'm not sure we know, but that is a profound change from 15 or 20 years ago when I think the prevailing sentiment in Beijing was quite different about North Korea. I think it's also the case that uh, sentiments and views in the United States and other countries about what we would like to see on the Korean Peninsula has changed substantially. I think there were periods in the past where major countries or elements within countries believed that a continuing separation of North Korea was in the best strategic interests of, uh, uh, of Northeast Asia. I do not believe that is the case any longer. I think there is a broad, overwhelming assessment that peaceful reuni reunification and a move towards unification on the Korean Peninsula is in the best strategic interests of most of the major players in Northeast Asia. And even countries where there have been some elements of ambivalence, I think some of that has been swept away 
by repeated human rights abuses, issues associated with the most provocative, antithetical language that emanates and rhetoric that emanates uh, from North Korea more generally. And here, I think I have to compliment both the last administrations. What we have seen is, in many respects, almost a sociological political change uh, in uh, South Korea and how they talk about unification. The idea, and if you look at the history of Chinese foreign policy, the greatest success of Chinese foreign policy over the last 30 years is the concept of one China and that nations and groups that stand in opposition to one China are working at cross purposes uh, in terms of the best interests of the Chinese people. I believe a variation of that concept is becoming more prevalent in South Korea, a sense that Korea is one people and one nation, and that efforts taken to divide the Korean Peninsula are not in the strategic best interests of the country. And I would say that the most recent very ambitious diplomacy between Madam Park and President Xi is at least a modest step in the direction of um, articulating a view of a Korea in the future that uh, does not face this uh, uh, division that uh, has been so difficult and problematic over time. I think the challenge that I've seen in a lot of the um, commentary in South Africa, excuse me, in um, uh, South Korea, uh, South, uh, South Africa is one of the examples here, uh, assumes that the process, however, will be smooth uh, and without difficulty. Now, you talked this morning about the economic dimensions. Clearly, the, the gap in economic performance between the North and the South is enormous. I think the going in presumption in German diplomacy was that if Germany saved an enormous amount, then the aggregate uh, uh, capability would allow East Germany to recover more rapidly, when in fact it was not the aggregate, but the differential between East and West Germany. And I think we're going to confront that problem in spades between North and South Korea. But uh, Victor asked me primarily to talk about the security dimensions of this problem. I think it would be fair to say that the United States, in conjunction with South Korea, but also occasionally with Japan and irregularly with China have had conversations over almost a 20-year period about uncertainty on the Korean Peninsula. These conversations between the United States and South Korea are extraordinarily detailed and complex, and they've become more so over time. The conversations with China are halting, difficult. In many circumstances, it is the United States that talks and China listens and takes notes, but doesn't feel that it wants to comment on circumstances in particular. And I think it is also the case that because of sensitive sensitivities between Korea and Japan currently, there are obvious limitations about what's possible. I think um, if you look at the situation 15 or 20 years ago in Asia, and indeed until quite recently, North Korea stood as sort of the one profound problem area in Asia. And if we could simply get beyond this, uh, this issue, then we would have at least the potential for more peace and stability and harmony in Northeast Asia. Uh, I remember our good friend, uh, our ambassador from Australia the United States, refers to Asia often as the sunny uplands, the place that Americans and others can turn to if they want to be reminded about returns on investment strategically and politically. I will say recent years suggest that Asia's future will be challenging, and we are facing tensions in maritime security issues, a variety of political uh, dynamics uh, that involve history, territory, future ambitions, military uh, protocols that will be extraordinarily difficult. I don't think there's much doubt about that. So the North Korean issue is not alone a lo any longer in Asia and complicating the political dynamics. However, I think um, at least what I have seen of late is that on almost every issue there is a level of uh, growing distrust and uh, a lack of confidence 
at strategic levels in Northeast Asia in terms of how you would handle a major problem, either around a disputed island, an issue associated with navigation, or a sudden change on the Korean Peninsula. And so it was the case that I think in the past that some, I was one of those people who had at least some confidence that there would be the necessary diplomacy uh, between the United States and China about developments on the Korean Peninsula. I think in the current environment, we would have to be somewhat worried that the parameters of that diplomacy would be extraordinarily complex and probably surrounded by an enormous amount of uncertainty and probably suspicion. And so it strikes me that in the period ahead, um, I was a person who believed that in our north-south diplomacy, that we should increasingly expect South Korea to take a leading role. And I think one of the conceits of American diplomacy with North Korea was to seek to lead that process sometimes without appropriate consultation and in fact leadership from South Korea. I think we've now reached a period where we should be confident and comfortable with South Korea taking a leading role in diplomacy with North Korea. But in addition to that, South Korea is, if we ever face the situation of dramatic change in North Korea, which I think is a very real possibility given the many uncertainties that we're facing in North Korea, the critical role on the peninsula is likely to lie in Seoul. In the past, I would have said that the critical players in this would be the United States and perhaps first among equals China. But increasingly, it will be the role that South Korea plays, which will require remarkable foresight, preparation, capability, maturity. These are things that I think require uh, very deep consultations between the United States and South Korea. The most important diplomacy that needs to take place in advance is actually not between the United States and China. That's critical, it's number two. What's most important is the diplomacy between the United States and South Korea about expectations, about preparations and the like. And then following that, a kind of three-way diplomacy that involves Japan as well, South Korea, the United States, and China going forward. All told, I would say if we faced a set of difficulties and challenges, uncertainties with regard to North Korea, I've said this before, but I think we really have two choices, two possible uh, ways forward. One is a set of very serious problems, right? And another even more serious set of problems, right? So there's no good outcome. There's no way forward that doesn't involve massive numbers of refugees, uncertainties associated with weapons of mass destruction, questions about the role of US forces, Chinese forces across the border, uh, what to do with uh, problems, schisms inside the military or security establishment in North Korea. These are all problems that will confound any stable, secure, effort uh, uh, and uh, I believe will pose the most significant diplomatic challenge of the last 25 years. So in conclusion, there are a number of things that I think the United States should be doing more of uh, with South Korea. Obviously we've talked about in the uh, morning sessions about the economic and commercial sides. I have to commend uh, North Korean friends, the steps that they have taken to welcome South Korean friends. It's imperfect, North Korean friends, to create opportunities. I would like to see the United States do more of that. We today host very few North Korean refugees in the United States. We should do more of that. And what we do, I think, uh, is primarily done by religious organizations. I think that's terrific, but I'd like to see other opportunities for North Koreans to come to study in American universities, to have the opportunity to train and the like. To date, much of that training is about technical issues, questions associated with just modern commercialism and, and the like. Increasingly, we're going to have to train and prepare some of these uh, people who've left North Korea to understand issues associated with governance, to think carefully about the way forward 
when I earlier talked about South uh, Africa, that's exactly what we did with South Africa for almost 25 years. Many of the people that uh, staffed the initial South, Korea, South African government were trained in the United States and Britain and elsewhere. We need to do more of that. We need to take that on. I'd also like to see a set of circumstances where we broadcast more, try to actually take steps to um, uh, have more information penetration into North Korea and have that be a little bit more nuanced and active than it's been, than it's been in the past. And I must say, and I'll just conclude with this, as we think about our overall toolkit, there is one element of our strategy that I don't think people fully appreciate. We often think of North Korea, I certainly did, as one of the most sanctioned countries in the world with almost impossible uh, uh, objective uh, obstacles for people wanting to travel, invest, or the like. It turns out, when I was at the State Department working on Myanmar or Burma, comparing Burma to North Korea is night and day. Burma has much more uh, in the way of sanctions and uh, challenges associated with interactions. And I do think if we faced a set of uh, further challenges with respect to North Korea, it would be possible for us to put more financial pressure on North Korea. And I think we need to let Chinese friends know and understand that some of the things that have been contemplated by the new regime, if followed through on, would entail and involve a reaction that is much more strenuous than we've seen in the past. And I think that element of our uh, diplomacy is likely to be necessary as we go forward. Ultimately, this is an issue, sometimes you ask yourself, how important are these sessions? How important are war games? How important are uh, issues associated with um, planning in advance? I remember a senior official when I was at the White House saying we had set up a, a morning session, four hours, to go through how to think about what would happen if we face a certain amount of uncertainty. And this person was a little impatient and saying, well, look, it's, there's so many parameters. How, this, how, why, why spend the time doing this? And I remember I responded. I said, look, this is not an attempt. There will be no answers. But to socialize yourself, to prepare to think about the questions and the challenges and the problems ahead. We have to do more of that, and we have to do it with Korean friends. And this is an arena where Track 2 and think tanks have an enormously important role. And that's one of the reasons why I'm grateful for Victor for taking this on. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Kurt. Um, speaking this, Dr. Kim, you'd like to use the podium? Fine. <clears throat> to continue that uh, dream team analogy, uh, all my life I, I thought I uh, belonged to the second team, uh, whether that be sports or things that I do to, uh, I do to make a living. Uh, I, I already thought that I, I belonged to the second team. So, uh, well, actually, I was a pretty good uh, basketball player, but I never made it to the first team. I was uh, in the second team. So to be elevated as a member of the Dream Team, to be treated as a, as a member of the Dream Team is, is, a, is a huge honor. Mm. Uh, so uh, let me uh, preface uh, by saying that uh, it's uh, really an honor to be uh, among distinguished experts and uh, distinguished uh, audience today. Uh, in previous sessions, in previous panels, we, we talked about uh, the unification benefits, you know, the benefits of unification that that can be brought about, you know, the, uh, the benefits that uh, the unification can bring to the people on the Korean Peninsula and, and, and people on, in Northeast Asia and major stakeholder countries in, in Northeast Asia. Uh, and uh, we also talked about the ways in which we can materialize those unification benefits in, on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asian region. Uh, what I want to do, what, uh, the, the, the thing I want to present today is, is a little bit different. Uh, I'd like to discuss uh, how we can frame this uh, unification uh, benefit discussion. I'd like to uh, incorporate 
uh, global perspective into this uh, unification uh, benefit uh, discussion. Uh, in previous semesters, we, we talked about uh, unification debug theory that uh, President Park uh, proposed early this year. Uh, I think uh, that debug theory, or a jackpot, or a bonanza, uh, if you will, but, uh, that jackpot theory itself was a jackpot, uh, in my opinion, because uh, in Korea, uh, for some reason, the unification discourse has been losing momentum in recent years, but uh, because of debug, uh, the, uh, the unification discourse has regained momentum and uh, has uh, rekindled uh, interest in Korean society, not just in Korean society, Northeast Asian region, uh, about uh, unification benefits. But uh, after debug theory has been proposed, uh, in my opinion, uh, much of the discussion has revolved around on material benefits, material benefits uh, that they can be brought about to the people on the Korean Peninsula mainly, and uh, people in Northeast, Northeast Asian region, and major stakeholder countries in Northeast Asian region, uh, quite understandably. Uh, my, my major point, I mean, of course, those, uh, those interests had been uh, defined in terms of uh, economic and security interest, you know, security interest, uh, material interest. Uh, my, my major point, one of the, my major points in today's presentation is that you know, there are, you know, the, the, the beneficiary of unification uh, benefit can be uh, much more diverse. And uh, the, uh, the, the scope of unification uh, debug or unification uh, benefit uh, can be much broader. Uh, in terms of a beneficiary of debug, sure, the biggest beneficiary of unification could be uh, people on the Korean Peninsula. But the unification would also benefit the people uh, in Northeast Asian region and also major stakeholder countries uh, in Northeast Asian region. Uh, that was uh, basically what the panel C was all about. Uh, but uh, that's not it. Uh, my, my contention is that unification uh, would be a world historical event that could contribute to the international community. So we gotta take this, uh, this uh, you know, unification benefit, benefit uh, discussion to the uh, international uh, community. Uh, in terms of scope of DEBA, in terms of scope of Bonanza, uh, you know, we, we tend to interpret the outcomes of unification mainly in terms of material interests, mainly in terms of security and uh, economic benefits, but uh, the scope of benefit can be much broader, as I said. Uh, the unification can contribute to many issue areas of international relations, such as non-proliferation, human rights, environmental protection, human trafficking, money laundering, and so on and so forth. So uh, if you have the, the booklet that I have, I don't know whether you have the booklet. Obviously, many of you don't. Anyways, uh, table one there is a snapshot look at the beneficiary and scope of a unification bonanza. Uh, if you take a, a look at uh, row number one, uh, you know, initially, uh, the, the benefit discussion uh, has centered on the Korean Peninsula, okay? and that it has moved to Northeast Asian region. Okay, but it seems to me that the, the, the discussion has stayed there in Northeast Asian region. Uh, and I think there is a, a need to take this uh, you know, benefit discussion, unification benefit discussion to the international community. Uh, and also the scope of debug, that's uh, role number two there. Uh, initially, uh, we used to think about, we used to talk about uh, you know, benefits of unification in terms of politics and in terms of you know, security, security and, and political benefits that the uh, unification would uh, bring to the people, uh, to the Korean uh, people, uh, to Koreans, and then also uh, people in Northeast Asian region. But after that, after Bonanza uh, theory uh, has been uh, initiated by Pro President Park, uh, the, uh, the, the benefit discussion have moved to economic realm. You know, we, we, we now talk about uh, uh, the benefits of unification in terms of economic benefits. And I think that was uh, what uh, session one, one in the morning was all about. But uh, I also believe that there is a need uh, to take this, uh, uh, you know, uh, unification, uh, you know, benefit uh, discourse or discussion, if you will, uh, to the uh, ma many issue, many different issue areas in international relations. Uh, why? Because uh, I think it is important for uh, you know, Korea to get uh, 
get uh, international community involved in, in this uh, unification discourse. Uh, that way we, we can have a greater appeal to the uh, international uh, community. Um, you know, if unification uh, is completed successfully, if, if we can accomplish uh, successful unification, I, I think uh, unification can work as what I would call international public goods, international public goods. Of course, I mean, the, the, uh, the unification plan has to be uh, executed uh, in, in proper manner in order for this to happen. Uh, you know, how does this happen? Well, there are two big messages that uh, unification uh, can uh, impart uh, five more minutes? <laughs> well, I thought I could be uh, very brief. Uh, you know, there, there are uh, big, big messages that we can, t uh, you know, uh, impart to the world. Uh, that, that is, uh, you know, intractable conflict can be resolved. If we put in good faith efforts, we can resolve these in seemingly intractable uh, conflicts. Uh, what I mean by this is, you know, the, the world is, is plagued by a number of you know, intractable uh, conflicts. And uh, I think uh, Korean Peninsula has been one of those zones of, uh, you know, age old conflicts in the world. So uh, by resolving these conflicts, uh, we, we can, uh, you know, impart this positive message to the world that age old conflicts can be resolved uh, with uh, proper measures. Uh, I, I think that uh, in and of itself can be a, a, a positive contribution to the international community. Uh, international, uh, I mean, unification uh, also means that, you know, integration is possible. Uh, what, I, what do I mean by this? Uh, you know, today's world, uh, growing income inequality uh, across nation states and within nation states has been uh, one of the many problems associated with the uh, unfettered advance of globalization. How can we resolve it? Or maybe, you know, a successful integration of, of uh, South Korea with North Korea can you know, present a model, you know, South Korea being one of the you know, top 10 economies in the world, uh, you know, successful, uh, you know, rich country, North Korea, one of the most backward countries in the world. So uh, successful integration of these two different societies can present a model for social integration. Maybe I'm being naive, but uh, these are the positive messages that we can uh, send to the world. Uh, and then, uh, uh, we, we are working on several visions or, or slogans, visions uh, with which we can convince to the world that uh, international, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, unification can actually work as international public goods. Uh, uh, slogan number one, or vision number one is a nuclear-free Korea, or peace Korea, if you will. Uh, you know, unif unified Korea will be free from uh, not just nuclear weapons, but all kinds of uh, weapons and mass destructions. And I think this will uh, contribute greatly uh, to the uh, strengthening of uh, international non-proliferation regime. Uh, the list goes on. Uh, I'll be very brief, actually, because I only have uh, a couple more minutes. Uh, Green Korea, uh, uh, unification will uh, restore ecosystem in North Korea and improve environment uh, on the Co uh, Korean Peninsula. And I think uh, DMZ, uh, Peace Park, uh, can uh, work as a uh, symbolic case or, or a test case uh, for this uh, endeavor. Uh, human Rights Korea, you all know this. You know, unification would be a great accomplishment uh, in terms of promoting democracies and, and uh, human rights values and, and human rights on, on the world stage. Uh, and uh, fourth slogan, I can think of Unified Korea as a promoter of a free trade. Uh, unified Korea will definitely pursue uh, free trade and this will uh, definitely uh, reinforce uh, existing uh, free international trade order. Uh, so uh, two points. Uh, unification means uh, resolution of all the problems uh, associated with uh, North Korea. Uh, it means uh, improvement of uh, world uh, security uh, situation as a whole. And uh, this, I think, will uh, uh, bolster existing world order and uh, existing global governance on many issue areas uh, in international relations. Uh, one caveat, uh, one caveat though, uh, what, one caveat uh, is that uh, in order for uh, the unification work as international public goods, uh, I think several conditions should be met. Uh, first, uh, unification should not be a, uh, a reunification uh, which uh, bring the situation to the uh, status quo ante 70 years ago. Uh, the unification should be new unification, meaning that we'll have to create a new country that embodies not just the nationalistic uh, uh, you know, visions or, or values, but uh, uh, 
you know, espousing uh, universal values. Uh, so related to that is that nationalism should not be a too much of a driving force for unification. Uh, should uh, uh, espouse universal uh, vision, not a uh, nationalist one. And uh, unification should not be an, a simple extension of Korean system to, to North Korea. Unification should fulfill a more refined uh, vision uh, so that uh, we can appeal to the international community and a more refined, refined vision, of course, includes, as I said before, Peace Korea, Green Korea, Human Rights Korea, you know, Korea is, is a big promoter of international uh, free trade. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm being too idealistic. Uh, this is just uh, my idea. And uh, of course, I mean, in order for this to happen, uh, we got to have solid plans and we'll have to uh, execute these, these uh, plans, uh, you know, implement these, uh, these plans uh, in order for the unification work as uh, what I would call international public goods to the international community. Thank you, thank you very much. And our discussion, Ambassador Roy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've had two very excellent presentations. Um, Kurt Campbell has stressed the complexity of the whole issue of Korean unification. And Professor Kim has talked about the potential economic bonanza it could create. In other words, looked at some of the positive aspects of, of unification. Our panel is supposed to be talking about unification and the security environment, looking at the broader, potentially global uh, uh, aspects of this. My reaction to the presentations is, we don't know how Korean unification will take place. We had four divided countries that resulted from World War II. Two of them have unified. The unifications in each case took place in ways that had not been anticipated. I mean, Vietnam, Vietnamese unification occurred largely because of the collapse of President Nixon's domestic political position and the fact that the administration was left powerless in dealing with the negative reaction to the Vietnam War to intervene in any way. And this created circumstances for the reunification of Vietnam, which was violent. It occurred because of a major war, and then it was still violent. It was an invasion, essentially, of uh, North Korea, into, uh, North Vietnam into South Vietnam. The German case took place largely because of the unraveling of the Soviet empire in Eastern Europe, something that people had not anticipated. Uh, and it was peaceful. So when we look at Korea and China, I think we should assume that we cannot anticipate at this point exactly what the circumstances are that will suddenly create the opportunities for unification, which could be either violent or could be peaceful. We can comment on the fact that the end results will have different effects. And certainly, one would hope in the Korea's case that the reunification would be peaceful and contribute to a more stable East Asia. Now, Korea has a special problem. It's at the intersection point of great power rivalries. Uh, in the 19th and 20th century, it was caught up in the rivalries between Qing Dynasty China and Imperial Japan, between Imperial Japan and the Russian Empire, between Imperial Japan and Republican China, and between the United States, the Soviet Union, and the People's Republic of China uh, in the post-Cold War period. And these are major contributing factors to why Korea is a divided country. The interests of the Korean people have been secondary considerations in this great power politics, giving rise to a phrase I think that uh, my Korean colleague here has referred to, that Korea has been a shrimp uh, among competing whales. Uh, I think it's fair to say, however, that Korea is no longer a shrimp. You could define it as a lobster, or maybe as a great white shark. <laughs> I don't know what you would say, but I think South Korea is much more in the position that West Germany was in at the time of unification. It has gotten real heft 
And if you look at the unification process, in each case of the two that have gotten unified, one of the parties was the driver in the unification process. And the other essentially had to accept what emerged. If we think about Korean unification, you would have to conclude that South Korea was clearly in a stronger position to be in the driver's seat in any type of unification scenario. But again, that doesn't answer the question of whether it will be peaceful or whether it will not be peaceful and whether it will contribute to stability or contribute to instability in Northeast Asia. Given the fact that the Korean people themselves have been the principal victims of the great power rivalry in which Korea has been either a prawn or a pawn, depending on which term of speech you want to use, it's clearly desirable that Korean unification should give rise to new circumstances in Northeast Asia marked by stability and opportunities for economic development and prosperity. Is that an impossible goal? The answer is no. And German unification, we've seen, has in many ways contributed to that. But you could also argue that German unification created circumstances in Europe which looked like a dream outcome for 20 years, and all of a sudden we're beginning to see the potential for new conflict emerging from the circumstances that were created by the collapse of the Soviet empire. So in other words, we don't want that pattern to repeat itself in Northeast Asia. It's frankly too dangerous, and we have to worry about it. This is not going to be an issue left entirely to the interests of the Koreans themselves. Great powers are still great powers. And Japanese interests, Chinese interests, Russian interests, American interests are all going to be factors in unification, not simply the wills and desires of the Korean people themselves, important as those are. From Japan's standpoint, it's unacceptable from a security standpoint for the Korean Peninsula unified to have the potential to drift into China's sphere of influence. And from China's standpoint, it's unacceptable to have a unified Korean Peninsula that could be used as a great power platform for threats against China. So how do you compromise those two types of considerations? Now, I think President Park in her Dresden speech wisely referred to perhaps we need some type of a cooperation and security system created in Northeast Asia that could address these types of issues. And I think that's a likely consideration. But the question is, are current security arrangements in Northeast Asia compatible with the type of new security and cooperation system that would have to emerge? And if so, how do you handle that transition? And once again, great power interests are clearly an important consideration. We often talk about the law of unintended consequences. But there's also the law of unexpected consequences. The two are not the same. An unintended consequence may be something that you knew would happen, but it wasn't the real reason why you did what you did. But an unexpected consequence is something you hadn't anticipated. Well, I think it's very important to try to anticipate the potential consequences of Korean unification. And one of those I would point out is this would leave China as the last country that is ununified. And my judgment as someone who's lived a long time in China is that is going to change the psychology of the Chinese people. And it's something we need to bear in mind. Domestic pressures in China to complete Chinese unification are going to increase if Korean unification takes place. And the problem is, while remarkable common interests have been created across the Taiwan Strait between the mainland and Taiwan, what they have done is they have lessened support for dangerous independent scenarios on the part of Taiwan. They have greatly increased support for maintenance of the status quo in Taiwan, but they have not increased support on Taiwan for unification with the mainland. So if unification of Korea were to create pressures from China 
to unify under conditions where Taiwan had not yet moved to a willingness to accept a unification outcome, we could have a very dangerous situation in East Asia. And this could be an unintended consequence of Korean unification, but it shouldn't necessarily be an unexpected consequence. In other words, we need to think about these considerations because if you look at history, things occur which then create follow-on consequences, and in many cases, those follow-on consequences are very negative. And that's not what we would like to happen in the case of Korean unification. So, is Korean unification compatible with the interests of the major powers? In my judgment, it is. Kirk Campbell, I think, referred to this. The United States has officially endorsed the concept of unification. China, in my judgment, cannot afford to oppose unification because it has not yet unified itself, and that would simply be untenable for China to impose the unification of a divided country. But it will want the circumstances to be compatible with China's interests. Russia, I don't think, has any reason to want to oppose Korean unification. So the issue is not really great power opposition to unification. The issue lies in the fact that has been referred to by our presenters, which is the developments since World War II have created two different types of Koreas that are far more different in their essences than was the division between the two parts of Germany, which when unification took place in Germany actually was very, very difficult to overcome. It wasn't just the economic imbalances, it was that whole different attitudes of mind had been generated on the part of people who had grew, grown up under a social system and those who had grown up under a free, open system. And you have those same types of differences embedded in the Korean Peninsula, and this is one of the issues that you need the cooperation of the great powers in order to overcome those types of obstacles in bringing about the unification that ought to serve the interests of all of the interested parties. Thank you. Ambassador Dr. Kim. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chao. Uh, I want to extend my thanks to the uh, organizers of uh, this conference. And it is also an honor to be a member of uh, such a uh, distinguished panel. Uh, there is no surprise left when uh, it comes to the last discussion <laughs> of the uh, last panel, but uh, uh, I will try. Uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Campbell uh, said in his uh, illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, especially, uh, I agree with uh, uh, what he said about the uh, point that uh, uh, the, the consensus uh, began to emerge uh, that uh, uh, Korean unification is to the benefit of all the parties uh, in Northeast Asian uh, region. So uh, now, uh, consensus uh, is that uh, Korean unification is not only to the benefit of the uh, to, uh, Korean nation and to the benefit uh, of all the countries uh, in the region. And as uh, uh, Dr. Kim uh, gave us, uh, told us that it is also uh, to the interest uh, of the world. So. Uh, I also agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Kim uh, laid out on the effect of uh, Korean uh, reunification. Uh, especially, I uh, like Dr. Kim's conclusion that uh, the beneficiaries and the scope of Korean unification is much uh, broader than uh, expected. Uh, so uh, I'm going to make some uh, comment uh, to uh, elaborate the important point the two uh, presenters uh, have made. Uh, the first point I want to make is that uh, uh, Korean uh, unification should be uh, pursued and achieved uh, in the geopolitical
context of emerging U.S.-Chinese uh, global uh, hegemonic uh, competition. Uh, I think uh, it is very important to uh, understand uh, this point uh, because U.S.-Chinese hegemonic competition is going to have a very significant impact on shaping the new international order in the 21st century. Uh, the Korean nation was divided uh, during the period of the Cold War. Then uh, what is the Cold War? The Cold War was the uh, hegemonic war between uh, the two uh, superpowers. So uh, the uh, Korean division uh, was made as a result of the first uh, post-war uh, global hegemonic competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, now, the Soviet, Uni uh, Soviet <laughs> Union is gone, uh, and China has replaced the United States as the next competitor of the United uh, States in the second uh, hegemonic uh, competition in the 21st century. So I think uh, we need to understand this uh, strategic uh, background uh, when we approach uh, Korean unification issue, a global uh, perspective. So uh, as uh, Ambassador uh, Roy, uh, explained to us in detail in his uh, discussion. Uh, Koreans were victimized, and uh, the Korean Peninsula uh, became the battleground for hegemonic competition whenever a regional and global uh, hegemonic competition took place among great powers. So uh, my point here, uh, is that uh, uh, still, there is still grave danger uh, uh, for the nuclear war as well as the conventional war with uh, North Korea's development and the possession of uh, nuclear uh, weapons. So uh, peaceful Korean unification uh, should be achieved to prevent the Korean Peninsula uh, again, from being uh, the battleground in the period of regional and global power transition and emerging U.S.-Chinese uh, hegemonic uh, uh, competition. So I think we need to understand the um, importance of peaceful Korean unification uh, from geopolitical uh, perspective of uh, hegemonic uh, competition. Uh, so when uh, I hear uh, today's uh, the discussion at this uh, conference, uh, the Park uh, government uh, focus on the economic benefit and aspect of Korean unification. But I think uh, it is not true. Uh, Park uh, government uh, also uh, pay attention to the uh, geopolitical dimension uh, as, a, as well as the uh, economic dimension of uh, Korean uh, unification. So uh, President Park Geun-hye proposed uh, the trust building process on the Korean uh, Peninsula as uh, South Korea's North Korea uh, policy to achieve peaceful unification. Also, uh, the Bakunhe government proposed the Northeast Asian uh, peace and uh, cooperative uh, initiative. Uh, so I think uh, these uh, policies of the current government uh, shows us that uh, the government is, the Korean government is uh, also uh, interested in the geopolitical uh, aspect of the Korean uh, 
uh, unification. So uh, this is the, the first point uh, I want to uh, uh, make. Uh, then uh, the next uh, question uh, will be what kind of policy options the Republic of Korea can take in this geopolitical uh, context to achieve peaceful uh, unification. Uh, my suggestion is that uh, Koreans need, need, uh, need to take a realistic approach based on the historical uh, lessons uh, they can draw from their dealings uh, with uh, great powers uh, in the past. As uh, Ambassador Roy uh, explained to us in, in detail, uh, Koreans experienced many different hegemonic systems uh, in the past. Uh, these examples include the Chinese tributary hegemony, the Japanese imperial hegemony, and the uh, Soviet communist hegemony, and finally, the American liberal hegemony. So uh, according to experience of the Korean nation, I think among these uh, different hegemonies, American hegemony was the most beneficial to Koreans in terms of security and the political and the economic uh, development. Uh, and also, the Republic of Korea on the winning side of the Cold War, uh, that was the first uh, global hegemonic competition with the help of the US ROK alliance. So I think maintaining uh, the US ROK alliance and uh, upgrading uh, this alliance in the 21st century is uh, critical uh, for peaceful Korean unification and uh, peace and prosperity uh, in the uh, region. And uh, as uh, 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 Dr. Cha uh, mentioned, uh, Dr. Campbell is the architect of the uh, US new uh, Asian strategy that is a uh, rebalancing uh, strategy. So uh, to approach the Korean unification, uh, unification issue, I think we need to mention uh, briefly uh, this uh, US new uh, rebalancing uh, strategy. Uh, my question is uh, uh, whether this, this uh, US new rebalancing strategy is uh, in the South Korean national interest uh, or not. Uh, my answer is that uh, it is in the South Korean national interest because this new strategy will strengthen uh, the US ROK alliance and it also deepen uh, diplomatic and the military and uh, economic uh, cooperation between the two uh, countries. Uh, uh, then the next point uh, I want to make uh, regarding uh, this US rebalancing uh, strategy is that this strategy is uh, a clear, a clear expression of U.S. intention to continue to uh, assume the role of uh, balance uh, in the, uh, the region. So uh, continued U.S. presence and security commitment as a balance in the region uh, was pivotal and indispensable to security and the pro uh, prosperity uh, in the region. So uh, the US ROK alliance and the US Japanese alliance were the two most important
pillars uh, to support U.S. presence uh, in the region. So I think in this respect, uh, it is very important to restore ROK Japanese relations. I think it is not prudent to give North Korea maneuvering room to drive a wedge between people of Korea and Japan. So good ROK Japanese relationship is uh, very important uh, for solving uh, North Korean nuclear issue and uh, peaceful Korean uh, unification. Uh, and also uh, to uh, approach Korean unification issue from a global uh, perspective, I think uh, I need to uh, briefly mention about China's new uh, strategy. Uh, Dr. Johnson uh, and uh, in the uh, previous panel uh, mentioned China's new uh, strategy that is a new type of uh, great power uh, relations. Uh, in my view, uh, from the South Korean uh, perspective, uh, the denuclearization de de of uh, uh, North Korea is an important litmus test for the successful development of China's new type of great power relationship uh, strategy. Uh, if China does not play a constructive role in resolving the North Korean nuclear issue, credibility in China's new strategy will be in doubt. Uh, I think uh, China uh, is not enough to provide conference rooms and room service for the uh, six party talks. I think uh, China needs to do more uh, to solve the North Korean uh, nuclear uh, problem. Uh, during the today's uh, uh, conference, uh, Chinese uh, specialists mentioned uh, Chinese, uh, uh, China's policy on Korean unification is called delayed uh, unification. I interpret China's intention of delayed uh, unification as an, as an attempt to extend the buffer area to South Korea, including uh, North Korea. I think uh, uh, the Chinese attempt to uh, extend the buffer area to South Korea cannot be successful. Uh, and uh, uh, this attempt uh, will be also detrimental to peace and prosperity uh, in the region. Uh, finally, I want to mention the North Korean uh, nuclear issue, which is the most serious impediment to Korean peaceful reunification. Uh, North Korean nuclear program uh, poses uh, three very serious uh, uh, problems. The first one is the transfer of nuclear materials and facilities to other countries and uh, uh, terrorist groups. The second one is the domino effect. Third one is uh, a nuclear war on the Korean uh, Peninsula. So because of time limit, uh, I will mention uh, just uh, briefly on the uh, domino effect. Uh, the United States is very concerned about the domino effect. It will undermine the MPT system, which is one of the most important cornerstone of American uh, uh, foreign policy. So uh, to, pre to prevent this uh, domino effect, uh, the U.S. provide nuclear umbrella to Japan and uh, ROK in the form of uh, extended nuclear uh, deterrence. However, uh, for South Koreans, North Korea's nuclear weapon 
is a cash in hand to be used anytime. In contrast, uh, extended nuclear deterrence is a check uh, which takes time to be cashed in. So uh, when uh, the de facto North Korea's nuclear status becomes a reality, uh, this domino effect cannot totally exclude it in South Korea for domestic uh, political uh, reasons. So uh, to avoid this domino uh, effect, the US and the ROK need to find a way to enhance independent conventional war fighting capability of uh, uh, ROK uh, army. So in this respect, uh, we need to pay careful attention to the recommendation, uh, the Polish uh, recommendation that uh, the US and the ROK need to consider signing uh, the Defense Trade Cooperation Treaty. The US signed the Defense uh, Trade Cooperation Treaty with uh, Great Britain and uh, Australia. So these treaties can be used as a model for the future uh, US ROK uh, defense trade uh, treaty. So uh, this treaty uh, will enhance the interoperability uh, between uh, the two uh, the military forces of the two countries. Uh, and also uh, this treaty uh, enables the two countries to deal with the, the conventional and the nuclear a threat from uh, uh, North Korea. And I think this treaty will also reduce the domino effect uh, in uh, uh, South Korea, making more clear a US commitment uh, to uh, South Korea. So this is my uh, Thank you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are short on time. We may have time for maybe one or two questions from the floor. Let me just start the uh, questions by asking, I mean, all of the discussants and speakers um, hovered around this question of unification, the United States and China in, the, in a strategic competition. I guess the very specific question I would ask, particularly our two presenters, is in your view, what specifically has to happen between the United States and China for Korean unification to be seen as a positive, a public good, as Dr. Kim mentioned, but as, as, as something that's a positive sum game for both countries. What specifically do you, would you like to see happen in order to reach that outcome? Um, now, I think we have time for maybe one or two from the audience, so uh, yes, ma'am, right here. Get her a mic. Um, howdy, I'm uh, Nick, Nick Malik. I'm an independent researcher. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, there's been a lot of discussion today that um, a unification would be uh, a benefit um, and, and broadly in the, in, in the interest of all the um, powers in, in Northeast Asia um, and, and would obviously deliver some benefits uh, to those powers. Um, but it strikes me that also um, we've um, overlooked the one key player, which is North Korea. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, noting it's an extremely opaque um, government in particular, um, there are, I would argue, some pretty significant costs to North Korea um, if reunification were to occur. Um, obviously, there would be some great benefits to North Korea's society, but um, I don't think we can assume that the elite would melt away in, 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 in totality or in fact that there is really um, any real separate, any full separation between North Korea's elite and the rest of society. Just wondered what the panel considers about that. Great, okay, thank you. Um, yes, Professor Kim, and that'll be the last question from the floor. Thanks. 
Um, <clears throat> I'd like to direct this question to Dr. Campbell. Um, <clears throat> how, how would you assess the prospect relations between Japan and China in the years ahead? And in what ways would the evolving relationship may affect U.S. interests, perhaps adversely? Okay, great. Um, so we have three sets of questions. Uh, uh, Kurt, would you like to start? Sure, I'll go quickly. Thank you. Great presentations. And I, I must confess, the, the point that State made about how China and its own uh, lack of unity would be impacted, I must say I had not considered that before, and I found that very profound, and I really think it's something uh, to think about more carefully going forward. Um, to Victor's point about what needs to happen, um, um, I, I think there are some elements of U.S.-China relations that uh, much higher level and uh, uh, regularity of strategic dialogue, I, I, and I just think um, I think there has to be more familiarity with some of these issues. To be honest, I think Chinese friends have been very reluctant to talk to the United States about North Korea, other than the well-understood bromides. And I think part of it is they worry that even the most careful discussion uh, could be leaked at any time. I think they probably have good reason to have concerns about that, right? I think the other issue is they're deeply ambivalent about the potential prospects of uh, uh, unification. I agree with Stape that I think they're coming closer to a recognition that it's either inevitable or something that is actually not uh, undermining potentially China's strategic interests in Northeast Asia. But still, it's, it's, it requires a kind of leap of strategic faith that, that I think when compared to the maintenance of the status quo, the status quo is going to look more comfortable. So ironically, if you ask um, Victor, what is the most important step? I actually think the gap in trust and confidence between Chinese relations with North Korea and, in contrast, Chinese relations with South Korea will be the biggest factor. Now, I, I'll be very careful. I can't go into great detail about this, but I will say occasionally you get some insights into how senior Chinese officials think. And a few years ago, after some high-level interaction between China and South Korea, I think some senior Chinese officials basically said, you know, I think we maybe didn't end up with the good Koreans. You know, I'd say it, it started to dawn on them that maybe they're not well positioned with regard to the relationships on the Korean Peninsula. And I think that's one of the reasons that we have seen such a dramatic move on the part of uh, President Xi and Madam Park. Now, my own personal view is that we should support that process. And China fully expects that we will seek to block it or deter it. But I believe that a better relationship between China and South Korea is one of the most important and, in fact, the only positive strategic development in Northeast Asia that we've seen in the last couple of years. And I have to say, as I looked at how Madam Park deftly managed her relationship with President Xi, I felt very confident that the kind of ally and friend that we had that wants a better relationship with China, but also understands the enduring importance of the United States. We have to support that. We have to encourage that. And Victor, if that takes root and grows, I think more than any single thing, that is likely to be decisive in the thinking of Chinese strategic leaders. Um, I'll just take the, uh, I think others will have other points. I, the question about the very important question, Professor Lee, about relations between um, China and uh, Japan. Uh, I believe that uh, these trends are profoundly not in the best strategic interest of the United States. And that there has to be 
a workable set of relations among uh, the key players in Northeast Asia. And, and we're getting dangerously close to relations with between Japan and South Korea and uh, Japan and China that frankly run the risk of triggering their own kind of crisis in Northeast Asia. And so that brings me, if I could, to the American role. It is often said that between Japan and South Korea, that the US has to be extremely careful how it positions itself in this regard. I would like to see the United States playing a continuing active role in not just encouraging, but insisting that Japan and South Korea work more closely together and get along better. And that the longer this process this goes on, it's not only bad for both countries, but it's very bad for the United States. And I know there's an enormous risk that somehow this will be misperceived, but I believe just simply a diplomatic effort that underscores that we want two of our best friends in the world to get along better is in our better strategic interests. And I think the general care about kind of not trying to play a role encouraging this process beyond the excellent first step of the President's meeting in The Hague. I think that's something that we should think about carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. Uh, yeah, from the perspective of South Koreans, uh, we definitely want to see more of cooperation taking place between the United States and China. Uh, if the relationship uh, exacerbates, uh, there is a possibility for two countries to uh, settle with the status quo rather than uh, supporting unification. I mean, if you think about uh, Cold War rivalry. I mean, when the Cold War uh, temperature was at, at its height, uh, the competition between the Soviet Union and, and, and the United States over Europe had been quite stable. I mean, they were happy with the status quo because the, the ba balance of interest was there, the, because the stake was too high. The neither side was uh, uh, willing to push uh, the other too hard. So uh, because of the uh, unpredictability of the outcome of, of the uh, unification process. I think uh, if the, uh, the, uh, the relationship between the two countries uh, exacerbates, uh, we worry that, that uh, the two countries might prefer status quo. So uh, we, we definitely want uh, more cooperation. And we like to arbitrate uh, the, the relationship between the two countries. But the problem is that we only have a limited uh, you know, wherewithal with which we can do that. You know, we don't really have uh, leverage. So, uh, one of the suggestions is, is actually made by uh, Madam President uh, Park, you know, to establish uh, some sort of a multilateral security channels, uh, you know, framework uh, in the region, so we can, uh, you know, uh, discuss cooperation on, you know, some of the easy issues, not uh, these, uh, you know, intractable, you know, uh, traditional security issues. By uh, co cooperating on these uh, non-traditional easy issues, we can cultivate the habit of cooperation, and maybe uh, with this uh, trust, and, and with the habit of cooperation, we can you know, apply this trust to a more uh, uh, you know, intractable you know, traditional security uh, uh, problems uh, in the region. Uh, just uh, if I can talk a little bit about the uh, worsening uh, situation between South Korea and, and Japan. Well, you know, all along, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we've been talking to uh, Chinese that uh, you, you, you guys are the only country that can pressurize you know, North Koreans uh, into uh, dismantling uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, my uh, suggestion is, I mean, I don't know, it's not my suggestion, my perception is that uh, you know, the United States is the only country that has uh, the, uh, the leverage over Japan and, uh, and uh, so, some sort of uh, you know, pressurizing uh, Japanese into adopting a uh, correct view of, of history. I mean, there are two different issues at stake here. Uh, one is a Japanese move to have uh, you know, uh, self-defense right. Uh, I think it's uh, doable. I mean, it's a worrisome, but uh, for a sovereign country like Japan to, to move toward having uh, you know, self-security uh, right, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's nothing we can say about this. I mean, it may be actually good uh, in the context of, of rise of China in Northeast Asia, Asian region, but uh, for uh, you know, Japanese uh, to uh, you know, uh, distort the history issues and, 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 uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and practicing uh, what I would call creative history, I mean, if you're national leaders, I mean, you can uh, practice uh, uh, creative history in your bedroom, but uh, for these national leaders to uh, practice creative history uh, in the public place, it has consequences and repercussions. So uh, what, one way, uh, you know, what, what uh, the United States can do is to sort of uh, pressurize 
you know, Japanese into adopting correct view of history. Well, that Thank can you. be, that is the topic of a whole other conference. Thank that you. I'm sure that we could have at some point, but uh, let me just say that I, uh, on behalf of our two American presenters, I know both of them have worked very hard behind the scenes to, um, to not necessarily pressurize Japan, but to try to uh, improve as best they can the trilateral relationship among the three countries, and um, I want to thank them for that. Um, just so, just to close um, uh, this panel and the day's events, let me first thank all of our panelists for joining us. They're all very busy individuals, and um, some of them have come a very long way to join us. Um, over the course of the day, I think we've had a lot of different discussions on unification and different angles to it. Let me just offer, in closing, five quick points, and I do mean that they're quick, five quick points about thinking about unification as a bonanza or a jackpot or thinking about it in the future. The first is a historical point, and that is that um, we talk a lot about unification, um, but I think the thing to remember is that division of the Korean Peninsula is a historical aberration. That when the history of this is written, it will be remembered that this 60 or 70 year period when South Korea grew dramatically and became a liberal democracy and a beacon of advanced industrial society in this part of the world, East Asia, it will be remembered as that, but it will also be remembered as a very aberrant period in Korean history because the actual history of Korea is one as a unified nation. So that's the first point. The second is a political point, and that is, and it was mentioned in some of the earlier panels as well as in this panel, when we think about unification politically, it, we should not think about it, it as being the extreme point. In the sense, what I mean by that is ideologically extreme point. You know, questions of unification, questions of North Korean human rights have always been sort of pushed to the far right end of the spectrum, if you will. And I think what President Park's speech and what the discussion here today has shown is that it isn't something that is solely the preoccupation of one particular part of the ideological spectrum. It is increasingly becoming much more of the middle of our discussions on policy and politics. Third, on security, and this is in part inspired by something Ambassador Roy said, when we think about unification and security, we don't want the solution to become the problem. Right? In other words, if we think unification is the solution, we have to work extra hard to ensure that the unintended consequences, the negative externalities, do not come back and bite us in the backside. We don't want 18th century balance of power politics to be what comes to East Asia after unification. We want 21st century uh, security community to sort of be the way we think about Asia. Fourth, on economics, um, we had a lot of discussion about profit and, and margins and all this that comes with unification. And I think that's a very important part of thinking about unification. Uh, but it's not just about profit, it's also about overall growth and overall reduction of poverty. And what I mean there is essentially that we know that South Korean economy will take a hit when unification comes. But in the longer term perspective, growth of the peninsula will accelerate dramatically. This was Mark Nolan's point from the first session. Uh, and most importantly, poverty reduction of the entire Korean peninsula will be dramatic. Right? And that leads to the fifth and the last point, which is that um, we talk about unification as a bonanza for Americans, for South Koreans, potentially for Japanese or Chinese or others. But we have to remember that the real, can you hear me? I think it's four o'clock. They've just turned it off. The lights go next. No, I'm just teasing. Sorry. <laughs> your parking meter is all expired. <laughs> The last thing to remember is that the biggest winner from unification um, are going to be the North Korean people. Yeah. They will be the biggest winners, and that needs to be com communicated and conveyed to them. Um, so with that, first let me thank our um, organizers and sponsors, the, the uh, N N NRCS, as well as the Korea Institute for National Unification, the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy, as well as the Korean Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade, 
Um, I want to especially thank uh, two of our members of the Korean delegation who did not join us on stage but have been participating. Um, uh, Dr. Chun, if you will, from the Blue House, who's joined us, uh, as well as um, as well as the president for the uh, Korean Political Science Association. Please take, Dr. Kim, please take a bow. We should also say thank you to Victor as well. <laughs> we, um, uh, I think uh, Ambassador Ahn started out by talking about how we had a dream team of panelists throughout the day. Let me just add that you've been a dream team of an audience as well. So thank you all for joining us.